Well, there is a very interesting case going on in where else, where do you think, Florida, where Susan Lawrence is being charged with manslaughter for the murder of A.J. Owens. And the facts in this case are relatively straightforward. There's only a few disputes about exactly what was said at what time. But for the most part, everybody agrees about the essential facts in this case. And the facts are the following. Susan Lawrence and A.J. Owens did not have a great relationship at all. They lived near each other. They were somewhat neighbors. And A.J. Owens had a number of children who would play at the in the lot right next to where Susan Lawrence lived. And Susan Lawrence was very particular about her, her property. She didn't want anybody running on her property or she didn't want things or toys left on her property. And she would complain a lot of times that the children would leave things on her property, roller skates or balls or running across her property. She really did not appreciate that. And she would call the police a number of times and the police had to report down, come to Susan Lawrence's house and talk to her and, and write a report about the trespassing complaints that Susan Lawrence was making against AJ Owens and AJ Owens children. Now, Eventually, this all escalated into one fateful night where the children were playing next to Susan Lawrence's uh, property, and it was getting very loud, and really, Susan just has had it, and she was telling them not to trespass, and she was getting very upset about it, and she actually did call the police and said, we've got these children again, they're being extremely loud, and they are trespassing on my property, and I've already warned them a number of times, and now they're screaming, threatening things at me, like they're going to get somebody to kill me, and it's really bothering me. And she calls the police and the police say, okay, we're going to dispatch an officer and just hang tight. Well, during that time, when officially she hung up the phone with the police, all of a sudden she hears banging on her door. And the person banging on her door is none other than A.J. Owens. And the question exactly is what was said? What did A.J. Owens actually say to Susan Lawrence when she was banging on that door? And there's been testimony that from... Every, all the reports, all the witnesses, that that banging was really a loud, loud banging. In fact, there was a neighbor who lived about a football field away from where Susan Lawrence lived, and she could hear the banging. The banging was so loud, and Susan Lawrence claims that she was so scared at this time that A.J. Owens was just going to burst through that door and really, literally kill her, that she felt that she has to act in self-defense. She went and she grabbed her firearm, and she shot through the door one bullet, one shot, and that's what killed A.J. Owens. And that's essentially the facts of this case. Now, what's disputed is what exactly was said. Everybody agrees that she, A.J. Owens was extremely mad and she was banging on that door and that she used some curse words while she was banging at that door. The question is, did she say the following phrase? I am going to kill you. And according to everybody, all the witnesses, she did not say that, except one person, Susan Lawrence. Susan Lawrence says that in her interviews with the police, she did not take the stand yet. We'll see if she takes the stand tomorrow. But she, have said, she said in her interviews that, yes, A.J. Owens absolutely said, I'm going to kill you. And therefore, she feared for her life, and that's why she shot through that door. Now, also, what's uncontradicted is that that door was deadbolted locked. It was locked, it was deadbolted, and it was a pretty secure door. Now, again, how secure it was, the defense tried to point out that they really the door needed to be fixed before, and the landlord came down to fix the door, but it was only a temporary fix, and it wasn't completely fixed, but the landlord, tempor uh, the landlord testified that the door was actually uh, structurally secure, and there's no reason why anyone should be able to bang down that door. However, there was a crack going down it, and he was going to do the complete job at a little bit different a later date, but he just didn't get around to it yet. But his testimony was that that door was secure. Now, also what came out in testimony was that normally Susan Lawrence would actually put an extra chair by her door to block the door. And she had a chain lock for further security of that door. And at that time, she did not have the chair in front of the door and she did not have the chain lock locked, but it was deadbolted and it was locked. So here the question is going to be, is this a good enough reason for Susan Lawrence to use deadly force on A.J. Owens? That is ultimately the question in this case. Was she justified in using deadly force? Now, before we jump in actually to a little bit more of the details of the case and some of the law on the case, I do want to point out that I think that there certainly could have been a case for the prosecution or the state in this matter to charge Susan Lawrence with second-degree murder. We all recall that just recently, Ashley Benefield's trial went on and she was charged with second-degree murder. And certainly in this case, 
One of the elements for second degree murder is that you acted out of, out of evil intent or spite. And here, certainly, there was definitely a very souring relationship between A.J. Owens and Susan Lawrence. There was definitely spite there. So you certainly could have made a case that the prosecution could have charged her with second degree murder. Nevertheless, they only charged her with manslaughter in this case. Again, she's still facing up to 30 years, which it, she's already 59 years old. So that essentially is a, a death sentence or a life in prison, essentially, which is, would have been the sa same thing as second degree murder. But it's just interesting how they chose to charge it. It could be that's part of their thinking that if they get the manslaughter, it's really the same thing as putting her away for life for second degree murder. But I just wanted to point out that issue that I think if you're going to charge Ashley Benefield with second-degree murder, certainly you could have made a case to charge Susan Lawrence with second-degree murder. And when you charge her with second-degree murder, there is a lesser included of manslaughter. So it could be they would have gotten the manslaughter one way or the other. But I just wanted to point that out that I think that it was interesting that they only charged her with manslaughter in this case. Maybe they just felt that that's just an easier way to go about proving their case. So what exactly did the witnesses testify to? We're not going to go through every single witness, but I'm just going to point out a few interesting things that the witnesses testified to, and then we'll move on to the law, and we may even get the closing arguments tomorrow. So one of the uh, witnesses who testified was um, Ariel Bias Rodriguez, and she testified that AJ was actually absolutely mad, and she was cursing. She was banging on the door. She was extremely mad, and she said, open the door, and she did say, the F word and the B word. So she absolutely did say that. So absolutely, she was a very, very angry at that time. Now, AJ, on another occasion, also said, and this is the same testimony of, of Ariel Baez Rodriguez, that AJ, on another occasion, said to Susan Lawrence, stop effing with my kids or I will fight you. So right away, you're having some thoughts that you can a reasonable person, if you're in Susan Lawrence's shoes, can think this is a person that is willing, ready, and able to fight me. And she is much younger than Susan Lawrence. She's much more built. And uh, Susan Lawrence is an older, frail woman. She, The, the uh, evidence so far is that she was suffering from a number of different uh, injuries that she had. She had an aneurysm on her left kidney artery. She had a number of medical issues with her neck. She has a neck fusion, a laminectomy. She has a torn rot rotator cuff. So she is a very old, fragile woman. She would never stand a chance against a woman like A.J. Owens. So this could be already in the thought process of Susan Lawrence that here she already had a different time when A.J. told her, if you F with my kids, I'm going to fight you. And again, this is also not in the greatest neighborhood either. That was brought out a number of times that this is not the greatest neighborhood that you want to be in. Then we have Jareth Gardner. Jareth Gardner testified. One of the things that he testified was that he heard that AJ said, B-I-T-C-H, open the door. And that's what he testified that she said. And it also, according to his testimony, it looked like there was going to be an altercation. By the way that he was perceiving the events, it seemed that there was going to be an altercation. Now, if there's going to be an altercation and you're Susan Lawrence, well, then you can reasonably be in fear for your life. Again, the Big question here is going to be that she really feel that way if she's behind a locked door, bolted. But nevertheless, that was his testimony that he did sense by the way that this was all playing out that there was going to be an altercation. We had uh, London Robinson who also testified and he said that he did see at a different time where AJ and Susan, again, were arguing about trespassing and AJ threw the no trespassing sign at Susan Lawrence. So here you have another incident where AJ is using force against Susan. And now they pointed out also that the, the prosecution, the state, they pointed out that this sign was nothing to be scared about. It was a little plastic sign. It wasn't like a big no trespassing wooden sign that can really hurt someone. It was just a very flimsy sign that you can pick up from Home Depot. And that's what she threw at her. And in fact, when the police came and reported and looked at Susan, they didn't see any injuries on Susan. So that was their testimony. But again, nevertheless, you see, you're seeing that Susan had a different uh, type of, I guess you want to call it altercation with AJ, where AJ did use some force on her. Now, also, for some reason, this is from another witness, that AJ believed 
that if Susan does not own the property, then she cannot claim that anyone is a, anyone is trespassing because it's not really her property. She's just a renter. She's just leasing the property. And of course, that was incorrect. And in fact, one of the police officers, uh, Shelly Kinsey, when she when she came to respond to this, what do you want to call this altercation with the tr no trespassing sign, she actually told AJ that the next time that this happens, you cannot go over to Susan Lawrence yourself. It's trespassing. If you feel that there's something going on with Susan and she's not treating your children right, or you need to get someone involved, call the police. Don't do this again. Don't go over to Susan Lawrence and try to settle this yourself. Call the police. And this is what she was told by Shelly Kinsey. Then we have Ashton Welfinger. Ashton Welfinger uh, was, a, was a deputy. And Ashton testified that one of the interesting things about this is that after Susan shot and killed, essentially, A.J. Owens, and they detained Susan, she appeared to be very indifferent. Not like shocked, not crying, not beside herself. She just seemed very indifferent, which actually kind of shows you that she had no problem with killing AJ. And it wasn't the fact that she was terrified for her life. Otherwise, she would have acted differently. Now, we have Charles Gabbard, who was the actual owner of Susan's um, house at that time. And he testified that he does not own the field next to Susan Lawrence, where all the children would play. And he testified that four to six weeks before the murder, he repaired the door. And the door to him appeared to be structurally sound. Now, he did admit that he was going to repair it better, and it was just a temporary fix for right now. But still, he felt that it was structurally sound. Now, the medical examiner testified, of course, and uh, she testified to the the uh, manner of death, of course, and she testified the, the cause of death. And uh, the, some of the things that she pointed out, which was helpful for the defense, is the fact that there was an abrasion on AJ's right hand. And that would suggest that this banging that was happening was actually happening. And that's why there's an abrasion on her hand, because she was pounding that door. And there was actually a neighbor of Susan Lawrence who shared the same wall. And she said that that banging was so loud, it was shaking the wall between. They shared a wall. And it was shaking her wall so violently, she was scared herself, not Susan, her neighbor, who shared the same wall. So, again, everybody's agreeing that AJ was pounding on that door. Everybody's agreeing about that fact and that she was using prof some profanity. The question is, did she actually say, I'm going to kill you? Did she say, I'm going to break down that door and come after you? Or was she banging on that door and saying, come out, we want to have another discussion? Now, also, what was interesting is that uh, she, she did, Susan Lawrence did two interviews with the police, which is always interesting when you're watching this, when you're thinking, why are you talking to the police? Get your lawyer in there and stop talking. All right. So this is a lesson for everybody. Don't talk. If you may be a suspect in a case, get yourself a lawyer. And that lawyer will most probably tell you, don't talk to the police. We're not going to have any statements, any interviews, nothing. We're not going to say anything. Uh, nevertheless, she did two interviews with the police and some of the things that came out was that there were some reports that she was actually using some racial slurs against these children, AJ Owens' children, and calling them not nice words and saying not nice things to them. She was very, very agitated with these children. And she claims in the interview that she never said those statements at all. She would never say those things. And there's about there's an issue about whether she took away one of the children's iPads. She said that she didn't take the iPad. And actually, what was interesting is that the police, Ryan Stiff, who was the lead detective in this case, offered her the opportunity to write to write the children a letter. And she actually took him up on this offer. And she wrote a letter saying, I'm so sorry that your mother died. I never intended for her to die. And I was just in fear for my life. So Essentially, that was the testimony that came out. Again, it's pretty factually a simple case. The question is, did she actually say, oh yeah, because all the witnesses testified that she that they never heard AJ say anything about, I'm going to kill you. Nothing like that. The only person saying that that was said is Susan Lawrence herself in the interviews. Now, she didn't take the stand yet. We'll see if she takes the stand. But that so far is what came out, that nobody heard her say anything like that. So now let's talk about the law a little bit. 
Okay, because it all comes down to self-defense. So this is taken straight up from the Florida statute, and this talks about the law about whether a person is allowed to use deadly force. So here we go. A person is justified in using or threatening to use deadly force if he or she reasonably believes that using or threatening to use such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself or another, or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. So we're going to talk about those two different bases to use deadly force. Number one is if you feel that there's going to be imminent death or great bodily harm to yourself or somebody else, or, and this is a very important or, or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. Now let's go on and we'll, we'll, we'll explain more about that as we go on. A person who uses or threatens to use deadly force in accordance with this subsection does not have a duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground. This is the famous stand your ground statute. If the person using or threatening to use the deadly force is not engaged in a criminal activity is in a, and is in a place where he or she has a right to be. So certainly in your own home, you have a right to be there and therefore stand your, stand your ground does apply. And then the question is going to be, okay, you don't have a duty to retreat, but does that automatically mean that you can use deadly force? No, you still have to fit in with the, one of those two options, either that you fear imminent death or great bodily harm or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. Well, what is a forcible felony. Well, a forcible felony is the following, and this is taken straight out from the statute. Forcible felony means treason, murder, manslaughter, sexual battery, carjacking, home invasion, robbery, interesting, robbery, burglary, arson, kidnapping, aggravated assault. So saying, I'm going to kill you, that could be aggravated assault. Aggravated battery, aggravated stalking, aircraft piracy, unlawful throwing, placing or discharging of a destructive device or bomb, and any other felony which involves the use or threat of physical force or violence against any individual. So all of those things do uh, are considered a forcible felony. And if the defense can make the case that AJ was going to commit one of these forcible felonies, then even if Susan Lawrence did not feel that her life was at risk, or that she was at risk of great bodily harm, she was still allowed to use deadly force. Now, let's take a look a little bit at the jury instructions here because that's always important. So, listen to this. In deciding whether defendant was justified in the use of deadly force, you must judge her by the circumstances by which she was surrounded at the time the force was used. The danger facing the defendant need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of that force. And that's the sentence that's going to be plaguing the defense here. Again, that the danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances, so put yourself behind that door and it's locked, and it's bolted, and someone's banging on that door as loud as she can and cursing at you. Everybody agrees that at least she was cursing at you. Even if she was not saying, I'm going to kill you. Let's just put that on the side for a second. If you're just standing behind that door and you hear somebody banging on that door so loud that somebody a football field away could hear that banging so loud and that your neighbor next to you is scared because of what's going on. And the door and, and the wall in between is shaking and the mirrors are shaking in the house. Would a reasonably cautious and prudent person with those same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of that force? Now, remember, she called the police before this. She called the police and they said that a deputy is on their way. Now, sometimes it takes a, it takes a while for the deputy to actually show up. So if she's thinking, well, there may be another five minutes before the deputy shows up and she may be already in my house, already beating me to a pulp, it's going to be too late. Should I wait for the police or not? So this is the argument. This is the argument you have to make for the defense, that if you're a reasonable person, a reasonably cautious and prudent person, and you hear somebody banging on your door as loud as they can, so loud, so hard that it causes them abrasions on their arm, on their hand. 
would you have felt that the only option, the only option is the use of that force? So that is one of them. Now, here's another part of the jury instruction. A person who unlawfully and by force enters or attempts to enter another's dwelling or residence is presumed to be doing so with the intent to commit an unlawful act involving force or violence. So is this an attempt? This is the argument. Is this an attempt by AJ to enter her dwelling? Does she want to enter the dwelling? Does she want to just bang down that door and cause Susan to come out? What exactly is her intent here? So if you're the defense, you've got to make the argument that this is AJ attempting to break down the door and enter into her house. And again, as we said about the forcible felony, forcible felony could mean home invasion robbery. And she intending to rob her? Probably not. But maybe aggravated assault. So this is also an argument that the defense is going to make. That this is actually she was intending to commit a forcible felony. And they're going to try to squeeze it in to one of these definitions. Now, aggravated assault is only according to Susan. Remember, again, according to everybody else, she never said, AJ never said, I'm going to kill you. So that's why this case is going to be interesting. Was she acting in self-defense when she was sitting behind that locked and bolted door? Was somebody banging down that door? And that's what everybody agrees on. And she's visibly extremely mad. And this is a relationship that has instances like this leading up to something like this. They were gotten to many, many disagreements and arguments before. The police were called on each other. And this is a relationship that is certainly heading down something similar to this. There's already the incident with the trespassing sign. So is this the time? Is this the time when AJ just going to cross the line and Susan could reasonably be fear, be, be in fear of her life? That is the question. That's what the jury is going to have to deliberate about. So we will see. Again, we have another day of trial, and there could be closing arguments already tomorrow. There's only, I believe, three more witnesses that's potentially going to be called by the defense. Then we'll go into closing arguments, and maybe the jury will already start deliberating tomorrow on this. So let me know what you think about this case, if you think that this is a case of self-defense or not. I think it'll be interesting to hear how this uh, the defense continues to try to build their case. I believe they're going to be calling some experts to show why why Susan Lawrence could have reasonably believed in her status that she is her fragile old medically uh, has, has many, many medical issues. That type of person in this situation could reasonably believe that her life is at is at stake or that she's in fear of great bodily harm. So I believe they're going to have some experts showing that. And then we're going to see what the jury does with it. So again, let me know in the comments what you think about this case. I think it's an interesting case. It's a short case, but still testing out the extent of what self-defense actually means. Well, that's it for now. Thank you all for watching. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, like, and we will see you next time.